Thanks for staying with us. Uh, you're still watching Ways. Now, if you just joined us, we're talking about um, national budget and accountability. And we still have um, Olushim Unigbinde with us. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Ways Africa one with the hashtag Ways, or you send us SMS or WhatsApp to 0818038 Based on what he is saying, you know, I, I, jot, I jotted down some points about no plans on ground. That is really scary. Because, you know, from my analysis of what a budget should look like, before you even decide to say you want to drop a budget, you should have a plan. This is what I want to do with the money when it mm -hmm. comes and you break it down. When you say no plan on ground, it's quite scary. And when he talked about, he talked about spending tool that, you know, trying to make sure that, okay, let it not look like we are not um, spending money. So we exactly. just create like a, <laughs> a working document to say, okay, this is where the funds are going. Exactly. Um, this is why you wonder why the economy is not working. You know, because things... we are spending too much. The, the key thing here is that we don't have the monies we are actually spending. From what he's just said. Ah. That's just what he said. That's quite interesting. Basically. So I don't know if we have um, Olushemu back with us. Mm. Okay, we're trying to, we are trying to um, reconnect with him. But we have some questions on, you mm. know, WhatsApp. I'll just read it out. Hopefully, um, he'll be able to answer that question. Because um, the budget company, that budget app, it was created basically, you know, to solve this problem of accountability. I don't, and I don't think he really understood where you were coming from with that um, question. And, that question. Because if I go on a website, you know, and I want to learn about something, me that I've gone to school, it is difficult for me to understand what it should look like, you know. And now imagine someone that Who is on the road, the you know. Idea. So I think maybe they make this budget, the subject of budget so vague that it makes the average person on the street not interested. Discouraged. Yes, disconnected from it. Completely disconnected from mm -hmm. it. So they, they feel that this is not important to me. Mm -hmm. You know, what is important to me is the food that I'm eating and nobody seems to care. And I think that is why a lot of our, uh, the people that we're supposed to hold mm -hmm. accountable in terms of budget implementation mm -hmm. and budget execution, nobody actually holds them accountable because people don't even know. No. You know, people don't Enlightenment know. Enlightenment is one key thing about budget that we lack in Nigeria. And mm -hmm. that covers practically almost everything that has to do with the financial sector. Absolutely. So it is not just about the budget. It is about everything financial. If the government decides to say, this is the monies we are supposed to spend, you give me a breakdown. Budget is supposed to be formulated. When we formulated the budget, what next? You, Where are you, the timelines? They don't then even, who, they don't who even also interact. checks for this execution that the budget, whatever it is that I have, you know, because when Ade was saying mm -hmm. something about, you know, let me just quickly read it again. Okay. When he talked about um, um, in the mid year, after the budget, uh, ministers applied to the federal government for more funds, line mm -hmm. of completion and incomplete projects. And this lingers on from one government to, uh, to another. So it makes me wonder then who is actually in charge of monitoring the funds to ensure that, okay, if I released XYZ amount of money to you, what is the, where, who, have, who is accountable? Who is accountable? And where, have, where, where, let me see the extent to which you have the XYZ spent billion has been the spent monies. to. You know? The key thing here is this there is no continuity in Nigeria. Let's call a spade a spade. <laughs> if you, I have the project. I think we're already used to that. If, if I have a project, um, I'm supposed to fix road or fix, um, uh, what's it called, street lights in a given area. And at the end of the day, this government goes away. I have done just the street lights. I haven't actually inserted the lights into the street uh, the, or the bulb into the street lights. Have I done my job? I mm. haven't. But guess what? anybody can come back and say, oh, okay, the job has been practically done. You know, this brings, and there is nobody to actually monitor this and say, this has been done. This brings a story to my mind. So many years ago, I mean, I, I think I've shared the story a couple of times in different okay. platforms. My father was called upon, because he's a contractor, he builds. He was called upon to come and build, like, I mean, to construct a road. It was a road project, I remember clearly. Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, the person that gave my dad the contract already was demanding for, for an exact, I mean, a figure, right? Mm -hmm. That this is how much he was going to take 
off of this project. And my mm -hmm. father looked at the project and looked at the cost and he told them, this quotation that I have given to you is what will complete the road. So if you are taking this huge chunk of money mm -hmm. from this quote that I have given, I'm sorry, it means that you don't want this road to ever be complete. Exactly. You know, so the, you know the person now said in Hausa, like in Hausa it means mm -hmm. just pour sand, you know, and pour sand on the road and act like you, you know, bring in your document. This was many years ago. I mean, I, so one would wonder what is happening now. Exactly. So this was many years ago. He said, just pour sand on the road and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, only for only for me to, I mean, so my dad now said, I'm sorry, I cannot do this. Because if I pour sand on the road, people die on that road from a, uh, from a result of blood, uh, road accident. Bad road. Their blood will be on my head. On my head. So, you know, even the, you, you are not even, you have given out this contract, this supposed contract, you know, because he said they were contracting items. Even if you contract this, this these projects items. to these people, you don't even give them the power to be able to execute this contract because of the, you have taken a chunk from that fund. But I think mm -hmm. we have Ole Sheung back. So if you're back with us, Ole Sheung, sorry for the break in transmission. We've just been, I mean, chatting away. So, um... I, 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 to you. Oh, you've been listening to us? Really? All right, so just go ahead and... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. I mean, this, I think we... Just, um, yeah, why is it? was what so what is your take on the chinese loan from the question that was sent in by kelvin yeah i mean so for me i look at the issue of the um chinese i mean chinese people they have their own interests they have um, they have their, they make their own decisions about um you want to give you a loan but we there's a way they wrap it around themselves that they are going to provide the company and the entire infrastructure to give out loan and I don't have a specific answer about Chinese. Or, I mean, I would just look at this broadly around external debt. We need to be very clear about the things that we borrow outside the country on. We need to be very clear. If we have things, if we have infrastructure that can be delivered locally by local, by domestic um, companies, why do we have to go and borrow externally from it? And I think the, the world is telling us something that with coronavirus, that you need to look in what's much more deeply before you start thinking outside of the world. You know, a lot of countries dependent dependent on China. Those those narratives will change post COVID nineteen. So we need. To, I want to build a pedestrian bridge, which is basically sand, cement, and a bit of steel rods. But I'm going to go and borrow money from China to deliver a pedestrian bridge. What sense does that make? Now, if you're delivering a power plant, you know that we might not have the entire capacity or technical ability to deliver a power plant to the country. So, and you go and borrow outside the country, it makes sense. So we need to, what we're doing about borrowing in Nigeria is that we borrow, but we borrow mainly for two issues. We borrow for our balance of payment situation, which means that when oil prices are dipping or are going down and we don't earn a lot from foreign earnings, we're borrowing to show up our external reserves. So we're borrowing money outside of the country to support CBN to be able to provide uh, strength for the Naira when it needs to. And we now use the Naira value of it to now solve whatever fiscal problems you have internally. So, for example, if you borrow a billion dollars now, you give a billion dollars to CBN, CBN converts the money to $360 billion and give the money to federal government. Now, that's useful for the CBN, but what does the federal government do with $360 billion? It's supposed to warehouse that money specific to say, I'm not just borrowing to support the CBN's balance of payments. I'm borrowing so that I can so get some some external obligations sorted if we need some expertise externally and i'm investing to do that that's the way it should be so i have a bit of challenge about how we go with our establishment we borrow and we just put in the federation account when you put the money in the federation account everything gets everything can be spent on can be taken from federation account people that want to buy logs vans to buy from it people that want to do seminars and conferences abroad take from it we have to warehouse our debt for specific projects Projects that are self-liquidating. That means on over a period of time, those projects can pay for themselves. The second part of it is, is to talk about constituency project, which is the second question. And in my own view, we're borrowing from a culture, but we are not effectively implementing what it is. In the U.S., which is where we take a whole of our presidential system of government, there's what you call pork and barrel projects, which means um, the Congress, because in the U.S., the Congress has more power over the budget than even the, than even the executive. So the Congress is the equivalent of our National Assembly. 
So what you get to see is that people, their, their votes are being given. Some funding is given for member, for member of the parliament or member of the Congress to implement projects within their constituency. Now, we have brought that up, you know, as a constituency project. It's not, a, it's not an entire bad, it's not, it's not a bad idea in entirety. It's, number one, the way we implement it now in Nigeria is that it's a symptom of failure. So, I mean, if I say as a, as a member of my constituency, I'm using this funding to support um, skill building and capacity building and vocational training, you know, tailored to, in, or tailored to improvement of my constituency, yes. But when you now turn constituency projects into building balls, you know, solar street lighting systems that communities don't need, that has become some form of, you know, nice way to award contracts to members of parliament, which is very, very unfortunate. So you see a whole lot of abuse, you see a whole lot of um, an abandoned project, you see a whole lot of waste of public resources in, in, through the constituency project. In fact, the federal government you know, doing things uh, that are not necessary. I mean, we, we went around Ikita at the point. Almost all the solar lighting system that were done for communities that needed water more, communities that needed school school facilities to be fixed, everybody was doing solar lighting. They it means that there's, there's truly no plan. There's truly no plan. But I have a question from one of our co-anchors has sent in a question, Chinasa. She says the budget mm -hmm. app was created to essentially foster transparency and make government accountable to the Nigerian citizen as a key for social change now do you believe that the app has been a tool for change and what are the key um, changes you have seen on both sides of government and the citizens since you created that app i mean great question it's been eight years now um, that we've been running budget so it's time for a lot of appraisal i mean and i think we have moved steps we have moved forward not as fast as i would have wanted it to be number one Right now, we have close to 33 states now publish their state budgets. When we started budgets, less than eight states were publishing their budgets online. It was even difficult to see state budgets. So we have seen a whole lot of improvement in the state budgets, which, I mean, we are helping close to 14 states specifically to improve their budget process in Nigeria. I mean, we are, and that's been a step forward in, in, in some sort of way. Um, the, the second part of it is also the budget office of the federation we've done a whole lot of support and engagement with them around open budget and now we have budget implementation reports more frequent we have the budget detailing i have uh, the problem i have about the budget is not just the documentation it's the entire f structure of the nigerian system the system is geared towards let us just spend and i think in that sort of way the budget becomes also reinforces that and doesn't just make it more about planning. But when you look at the budgeting system itself, there's been a lot of improvement in the last few years. Um, that on the local government, there's still a big problem in that. Where we have more challenges has to have to be with the citizens. I mean, we reach close to our own can we reach close to eight million Nigerians in a country of maybe let's say to be fair, and have, we have the size of Adult population in Nigeria is around 90 million. So we reach 8 million people by our own mathematics. And and I ask myself, we've still not done enough. I mean, why are we going to be able to reach all Nigerians? I mean, how much resources would we need to be able to reach 90 million Nigerians in terms of work on the media and push and engagement you know, and making sure we understand that um, you need to hold your government accountable. So there's a whole lot of work to be done. And we can't even do this alone. Budget can't do this alone. We need budget in every state. We need budget in every issue in Nigeria. Okay, so budget, budget, budget <laughs> there's a question for me, uh, for you. How you manage the buhaha around your appointment and you finally came oh. to terms to resigning, with resigning? You know, because you say you need budget in all the states. If you were in government, it would have been easy for you to get budget in all the states. But you turned <laughs> down an appointment, you know, and for us, we felt that, yes, I think... That was a move for, of, from in, uh, a place of integrity. I felt that way, you know. So why did you turn down that appointment, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I thought I wouldn't get this question uh, again. It's coming, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it was not, I mean, I worked in the, I worked two, for two weeks in the, in the Ministry of Budget yes. and National Planning. So um, even before it went public and everyone knew, I already shared a note online that, I'm taking this position, um, and I'm doing this uh, as, a sh as a temporary work, just to understand how public financial systems work much more and be able to support the work from the outside. Um, when the noise came up, I mean, and it everybody looked at the noise from the outside. I mean, no one has documented the noise on the inside. In you know, here, I'm trying to say, um, a lot of people say, "Oh, it was a social media pressure that got you to resign." No, I mean, on the day of the 
On Monday, which is the day I resigned, which was the day I resigned, I, I was still at work. I was still in Abuja on that day until I found out that I mean we might not be able to proceed in an atmosphere of mutual trust, and I'll put it that way. Uh, mutual trust where I'm able to um, offer my services and I'm able to get results. And I felt maybe it's not just time. I mean, I, I wanted to help. I've taken a whole lot of sacrifices to, to take up the appointment, I mean, financially, um, psychologically. I mean, and I, I just wanted to just say this is my opportunity. But if you feel that we do not have, we cannot, we don't, uh, people have sowed seeds of discords in the system about your personality and to create a sense of mistrust, the best thing is to, I mean, just go home and, and believe that there will be another opportunity. And if oh, there is another opportunity, absolutely. The, the work we have to do is we'll keep, keep doing the work. So, if he has a question on accountability for you. Okay, so $360 million was recovered by the President Buhari government of Abacha's loot, and a total of $2.4 billion of the looted funds was recovered in 2019 as stipulated in the 2020 budget. So, here is my question. How do we keep the government accountable so that these funds will not be relooted? Thank you. It's a good question. And it's one of the things that we are building that awareness about. You know, Abacha, Senator Senator Abacha is the gift that keeps giving. I mean, and... We just, just can't, we can't, we are, we are in the state of, we're taking $3.6 billion so far, and we can't specifically. And this is what problem which I go back to that. When we take funds in Nigeria, either it's debt, either it's patriotic loot, we don't find a way to warehouse funds and specifically tie them for projects. So you, the argument here from government is that we've put it in the federation account and everything goes in that space. So my... I'm happy that the new agreements, I mean, with the new, the recent one that was just received, $311 billion, had specific instruction that the civil society must be involved in the process of implementation and they must be able to track. Because what we've done with the past, even the previous one that was taken two years ago, the $322 million, I mean, that's still in process. There's a tripartite agreement with the World Bank. But I'm still not convinced that that's the best use of the resource. Those are, that's the best use of the resource. We could have done, you know, we could have thought much, much more think deeply about how do we put these resources to use. I mean, people's futures were robbed because of people's stole in, in, in an incredible magnitude. So it's very important to think through even what's the purpose of the funds. For example, even the 311 billion. We're going to use that money to build Second Niger Bridge. Is that the best use of that resource? Second Niger Bridge should have been warehoused in the PPP structure that is told and is paid off over years. But we are going to be using a bachelor loop that we could have invested in education in health and social welfare. Absolutely. And we're going to use that. I mean, we, we're not thinking. And that, that's my first problem when we are structuring the use of this funds. But well, that's been decided. We can't change that. Well, how do we but now even there's... get our government to just think? I mean, quickly, just on a final thought, because we don't have any time left. How do we get our government to start to think what project is important and invest there first? It's, it's relentless demand. Nigeria needs to show more interest in governance. The level of you see governance as a party, as an entertainment, as a comedy, it is not. It is affecting your everyday life, your everyday decision. So it's very important that Nigeria doesn't, don't just get moved around by the, by the entertainment around the election. Pay attention to governance and support civil society organizations, the budget, CIE, SERAP, CDD, CISLA, CODE. Everyone that is trying to be a voice in out there that will hold the government accountable. That's the only way. When 10 people are speaking, 20 people are speaking, it cannot change. When we have 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 people speaking, then we are beginning to move the needle gradually. And secondly, on the on the Abacha route, there's a public bid um, for CSOs that are interested in tracking the fund. So we are putting a bid for that. And hopefully, if, our, our, if we are considered our partner, they were able to engage much more deeply how the funds are used in the end. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Olusha. We would have to agree that this is just part one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for coming to join us this evening to deliver a fantastic show. Um, thank you again. Yes.
Thank you. So please you. watch a repeat broadcast of this episode tomorrow at 3 p.m. It's been really, really insightful. You need to watch it over and over and over again. It will be posted on the YouTube link and keep all the conversations going on all our social media platforms at mm -hmm. Wayshow Africa or at Plus TV Africa as we continue to hear mm -hmm. what you're saying. Now, in case you missed today's quote from our dear President Muhammadu Buhari, economics that grow <laughs> fastest at the, uh, the most sustainable rate are those that actively promote trade and attract investment. Investment. Now, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll see you live 8 p.m. on Friday, Friday. for another great time. <laughs> Bye.